rising. <laughs> there we are. Grand rising, everyone. I like coming to live. Spirit and coffee. Got my coffee here. Mm. All right, let's get started. Um, yesterday, pretty powerful readings um, from the Emerald Tablet Alchemy for Personal Transformation. <clears throat> really talking about um, sort of the beginning of our damnation in some way. And I don't want to say damnation, but it, it's really caused this really <laughs> whirlwind of a crazy around the world. Um, and so what happened? Well, it was us, right? We've created sort of this craziness right now um, because our minds, right, are, <laughs> we utilize the uh, imagination and run crazy with it and then use it for our own benefit, manipulation. And so we've taken out some really important things in our education system and all around the world and different parts that allow us to co-create with the divine and and really separating us from the divine saying that we um have to go through some sort of um intermediary right like we have to go <laughs> through somebody in order to get to the divine when in reality you don't you have access to that um once you realize who you are and how powerful you are right you are the vessel that holds that energy uh potential and it's it's a a seeping small energy right it's not the all but it is and so we allow that to move through us and flow through us if we don't have any hangs hang ups mentally emotionally and physically and so the vessel being the hardest thing to maneuver but also it's magnificent and also magical that we have a body that we can maneuver through this. Okay. Good morning, Kumar. How are you? Uh, good morning to you. Okay. So let's get started. Surprisingly, it is the only uh, at the fringes of modern culture where the truly divine can still be found. For the most part, organized religions and government policies come between man and the divine. Um, and then we talked about the aborigines. Aborigines um, and Native Americans, um, they continuously um, believe that the state of consciousness is known as dream time and can enter into matter. Um, and so they see it everywhere. Dream time is not like associated with sleep, but induced by rituals that include chanting, drumming, dancing um, to clear the mind and allow deep concentration uh, by focusing awareness on material objects and finding the in between. So understanding that we are part of it and it is part of us. It's kind of like when the monks are like stare at the rock and then you start to realize that you are the rock and the rock is you and that there is no difference. There is no separation because everything has consciousness within it. Um, and so we are able to get into the dream time, the dream world, which is the are the unconscious, if you want to call it that. And the collective unconscious where we start to sort of have this imagination about how things can be. Now, it's taking that imagination and creating something from it. And that's the part where people get hang, hung up too, because you can either be too high in the ether or too low to the ground. But if you find that space in between, you find co-creation there the space in between the above and the below. And that's kind of where we're fixed, right? We ourselves are in between the above and the below. We have this um, feeling of spirit of what gets us going, right? We have consciousness. We can communicate. We're not just a vessel that doesn't think. We think. We have consciousness. So we're able to connect to this happening of the world and viewing it and, and reflecting upon it. But our vessel is very material. So we're part of the above and the below. And we're sort of in the middle. Now, learning how to operate in that space is different. Because we can operate totally in the material world. And operating in the material world makes us very dense, very heavy. And that could lead to some sickness. So we need both. And if you notice, there's people like, well, I don't believe in spirituality. I don't believe in all this stuff. If you, you go back in history, you start to look at individuals who are say not have no spiritual life they tend to be um sick more often or they tend to be very heavy or they tend to have a more negative uh, i want to say pessimistic not negative they're a little more pessimistic about life and then you have the individuals who are maybe too fleeting right about life and live too much in the ether and they're too optimistic so it's kind of finding the balance in between the both 
getting to material means that you think everything exists outside of you and not inside of you. Thinking everything just exists inside of you and that we don't have a body can lead to, well, we call it mental illness now, but I don't call it mental illness. It just means that you need to bring yourself back down to earth. And when we learn how to operate between the two, we can start to co-create. And, and it's beautiful what's unveiled, right? If we look at it, we can say society is crazy right now. It's a big mess. But there's some beauty in what we've created as well. For instance, the architecture that we see around us, buildings, the masonry, um, the buildings and all the, the Masonic principles that went into creating, right? Because Masons were actually stone carvers to begin with. That's where it came from. And we look at this um, and it's, um, it's really powerful. We say, wow, look at the pyramids or I'm reading a book on the pyramids right now um, and how they created it and how the internal granite of the, um, or limestone inside the actual pyramids was so smooth. The technology that created it, we don't know what the technology was, obviously, but we do know that it exists and that it's this big, beautiful pyramid that pyramids that are just in the middle of, well, they weren't nowhere at the time, but now they kind of seem in the middle of nowhere. So we have the ability to create these megalithic things. And if we looked in the past, because they're still scratching their heads about how, like, how in the world was this created? Well, to be honest with you, they were using alchemy in a pure form back then. They were co-creating with nature. And that's my belief. Now, some people say it was aliens or whatever their, whatever their theories are. But the reality is, is that we were closer to nature back in the day than we are now. We're further, we're more separated from nature and natural law than we've ever been. We've been very scientific. We think we're getting closer to nature through science, and that's not true. In fact, we're objectifying. We're objectifying what, it, what we see around us. We see it as separate from us when in fact it's not. And that's what this is saying is that those two are interconnected and that when we can find that interconnection between us and the rocks, we can actually use the potential of natural law to co-create, which is what they did in the past. And that's why we see this these beautiful megalithic things that we're just like scratching our heads now, like how did they do it? Well, we're using technology now. They were using probably natural law you know, they talk about this to levitate the stones and all these things. Well, where did that come from? Well, magnetism is very much natural law. When we look at magnets, right, we're able to look at magnets. And if you could see it, sometimes they come together. And if they, I don't know if it's the opposite. Anybody who knows magnets, please tell me because I can't remember. It's positive, positive, reflect each, uh, deflect each other. And it's positive, negative, come together and stick together like glue. And the, the more magnetism, the stronger the force, right? So we see that natural law has this, this energy potential. Then we've tried to put it into science and objectify it instead of co-create with it. Let it be a part of who we are. It's not a part of who we are. It's separate. It's like, oh, this exists outside of us. No, it doesn't. It exists inside of you as well. As within, so without, as above, so below. So to co-create in that way. Okay, as the other end of the intellectual spectrum, scientists working in the quantum mechanics and astrophysics are forced to confront the divine presence concealed in matter. Physicists are slowly realizing that both ends of the universe, from the smallest atom to the largest galaxy consciousness, the one mind of the Emerald Tablet, plays a fundamental role in creating reality. And we see this as a hologram. So they're trying to explain it like, well, we're in a hologram, or we're in a matrix, right? That's what people keep saying. So there's a book I read, it's called The Holographic Universe, and it, it talks about how the universe itself is a hologram. Um, and so quantum physics would give us that idea. And it, it, it's pretty crazy uh, when we start to think about the classic physics and quantum physics, right? The two seem very separate, but they're not. They can interwork together, but they don't tell the same story. And the mathematics on both of them are not 100%. So... This leaves us in a conundrum. We say, well, maybe it's numbers that has created this entire universe and it's in its patterns. Then we say, well, it's frequency or vibration. So there's all of these theories, right? And the reality is they're theories. We can never know the full construct of how this was created. 
for instance, if we were, let's say, in a video game, and we we have this happening right now, so it's not far fetched that you know we could be these avatars living in some kind of simul simulation. I mean, it, we're it's already being co created um, through the metaverse, right? When we think about it, so if we were in a simulation, we would never know that we were in a simulation or how to get out of it. That I mean, you just can't, right? You can never know it all, but you can try. It's almost like the cave, right? Where Plato's cave. You can't know. We're just looking at the shadows on the wall trying to figure it out. Now we have theories about it. Hey, GP man, how are you? We have theories about it, but to, to co-create, here's the cool thing. Does it matter? Perhaps. But what's more important is that we have the opportunity to exist within the simulation, if that's it. Now we can maybe get out of the simulation. I don't know. There's all these theories, right? In the matrix gives us a bigger theory about it. Like we can unplug from the matrix. Well, if, if this was a matrix world, how do we unplug and where do we unplug? And do we want to unplug? Might be scary, right? There was a point where I could feel another self being pulled. And, and let me tell you what, the re-entry back into this world was the scariest thing I had ever been through. And there's really no words to describe the experience. So you all have your experience, but again, we're co-creating with. So we exist within this world. There's laws that actually play in this space. There are laws. Now the laws, I want to get into this a bit because the laws that we are playing by, whose law, right? Well, the government has created their own laws and that's man-made law. If you want to understand the law and how to co-create with the law, Use the law of nature. Go to the law of nature. The law of nature will give you all the answers because you're part of nature. You were created through nature. The law exists within you. It can't be taken away from you because you were a part of it and it is a part of you. Now, man-made law is a different thing. That tells us what's right, wrong, good, or bad, sets moral standards and values, where when we looked at it, if we just allowed nature to exist the way it was, there's a lot of things that we wouldn't agree with as humans. For instance, insects are a prey mantis. So look at that. Like how the hell is prey mantis? Well, maybe you guys know or don't. But how the hell does a prey mantis matter in, in what I'm talking about? Well, let's look at it. What does a prey mantis do? The, first of all, the woman, if she's hungry during the time that they're having, you know, intercourse or play, whatever it is, that he, she will eat the head of the 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 man the black widow eats the husband <laughs> i don't know if it's the husband but she eats the male you see we wouldn't agree with that as humans right for a woman to go and eat the man that's just weird right it doesn't even sound right but we have these laws but if we looked at natural law that's part of natural law you think we can rationalize with a with the insect about not doing that i mean who would do that who's going to sit there and and try to um tell the insect not to do that that is their natural essence and that's their natural way of existence now we demoralize it because why because we're human and we're like well, yeah we're not going to go eating people that doesn't sound right right seahorse carries the baby yeah exactly so the way natural law plays out um isn't necessarily we get in the way of it and we say it's not right it's basically what happens. So there's some, I, this, let's just say this, living on this earth is not as, we romanticize it. And I think we're trying to live in this romanticized way of looking at the world. And, and the reality is, is it's a lot more um, crazy out there than we think. If we let natural law take over and <laughs> we would be back in, you know, we wouldn't be at the top of the food chain, if you will. We would be fighting. See? So there's a shift. And so the consciousness took over and we created our own laws. Some of these laws are weird. Some of these laws don't make sense. And then we have different points of view because we have consciousness. So looking at the law, if we do go to natural law, though, and very elementary point of view, right, of natural law, cause and effect, 
we see those things happening, right? If I do something, you know, something's going to happen. The law of correspondence, as above, so below. What we do internally has some kind of an impact. So we can look at natural law. There are seasons, things change. There's always change and transformation in natural law. Nothing stays the same. And it's these are things that are just being regurgitated over and over again, saying in different ways. But if we hold on to things, see, humans will hold on. I think I talked about that book, Who Moved My Cheese. If you read Who Moved My Cheese, you will understand that Who Moved My Cheese is a great example of how we do not let go and we cause our own suffering. Animals will move on. (laughs) There's animals who cry, like elephants, right? So, (laughs) but they, they have to move on and we move on. And if there's no food, they move on. They don't stay in one place. We, we hold on and then we cause our own suffering. Follow natural law. Okay. The stream of knowledge summarize. Okay. The one mind plays a fundamental role in creating reality. The stream of knowledge summarize astronomer Sir James Jean is heading toward a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Um, mind. Oh, and that, so I want to talk about the distinction there, because that's really important for, especially for paradigm shifts, for the consciousness and where we're headed. We were a mechanistic um, society. Everything was based on clocks, machinery, mechanics, and we operate our body as though they're mechanics. And now we're starting to say we're not robots. That's where that's coming from, because the consciousness is changing. The paradigm is shifting, shifting into integral practices are living systems. Those are two of the biggest paradigm shifts that we see occurring now, where there's an integration of um, the mind and the body as well, and an integration of emotion and science. Because when they started to look into quantum physics, they realized that we don't operate like a machine. And so now this is where the whole Quantum physics is really what opened up this new way. Good morning, Radio Project. It's been a while. It's um, the new way um, for us to see the world. We started to understand that we weren't like, um, it was in a mechanistic world. And the mechanistic world is a duality. Right and wrong, good and bad, black and white. Um, What we're understanding now is that we have to integrate the both and. Um, We knew this before. This is, you guys, this is just a remembering. It's not like something new. People are like, oh my God, this is all new stuff. It's not. There's nothing new under the sun. The yin yang is the best representation. That symbol is very old and very ancient, right? And it's probably the best. And I had, I know my professor, one of my professors like, this is the best symbol in my opinion. And I agree because first of all, it speaks of infinity when you start to see it in 4D, 5D, right, you'll see that it's like this infinity, but it also honors both the light and the dark. And it recognizes that in darkness, there's light and in light, there's darkness. And so it honors that there's both, that it's not an either or conversation. The mechanistic worldview created this, this um, separation, which is either or, black or white, up or down. And that's created a a huge issue for some people. Let's just say the majority of the people on the planet right now. That worldview has really screwed us up. Okay. The consciousness now changing into integral practices where we are integrating. Because what happened when we did right, wrong, good, or bad, we took the intention and emotion out of everything and we put it into the science. That's where the mechanistic world came from. Then they were like, well, you guys are machines. So we wonder why we're seeing technology. Well, technology derived from that. Mechanics. Good, bad, right, or wrong. It's not. There's good and there's bad. There's consequences in both directions. But in the direction where it's going really bad, right, where we're starting to um, really just (laughs) take this world for granted, um, it's becoming a detriment to a lot of individuals. So we're having to look at the world and say, okay, we need to reintegrate the emotional piece. We need to reintegrate that there's some, when we have a physiological experience, 
it creates a thought in our head. Those thoughts then create how we move through the world and then how we move through the world will dictate what we see on the external or what we create in the world. Again, this is not like new information. There's books and books and books and books on it. But it's applying it to your life and having that aha moment where things trigger and they go, you go, oh shit, now I really get it. Not just as a concept, but you embody it. You start to move towards that. So a lot of it is reclaiming that emotional um, stuff that we, we've been suppressing. Yes, the uncomfortable pieces which are the most important for us to overcome, right? Because they're like, yeah, we're going to put emotions back in, but let's just have good ones. Let's not talk bad stuff. Well, I'm not saying we're going to sit there and talk bad stuff forever, right? As a life coach, I'll say, I had a friend, uh, another coach, and I use her stuff because I think it's, it's true. It's powerful. It's like, okay, you're in your shit. How long do you need to be in your shit before you move out of your shit? <laughs> okay, well, I need a day. Okay, good. Go take a day to be in your stuff. And then after you're in your stuff and you're going through all of that, come back and let's let's work through it and see. So it's okay to be in your stuff. It's okay to, but you don't want to stay there. That's not where you want to live forever. So you have to learn how to move through it. And you move through it and then you start to co-create in a different way, see life through a different lens. You learn something about yourself and you learn how to set boundaries and it goes on and on and on and on. And that's psychology and I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay, so the mind no longer appears as a, an accidental intruder to the realm of matter. We're beginning to suspect that we ought to rather, that we ought rather to heal as the creator and governor of the realm of matter. Okay, so again, just remembering that we have consciousness. We're not a we're not a machine. That mechanistic way of looking at life have to be in it to let go of it. Yeah, even if it's uh, for a split second. Yeah, and even if it's for a week, <laughs> just not forever, because that becomes toxic for us. That'll be a toxic environment to us. Um, so remember, and I think you guys know this, we're too intellectual. I'm even very intellectual. Like I go more towards intellect, right, than emotion. But looking at how to process the emotions uh, more and more and more and more. And here's the cool thing. The, so the difference between, I've said this a million times, but the difference between a master and beginner is practice. That's really it. I mean, you should, you guys know this. It's just practice. So the more that I practice processing emotion, the faster I get at it. That's really sort of the trick that they do, the monks, right? The ones that are just like up on the hill meditating or whatever. It's not that they don't experience suffering. They do. They experience suffering. They just process faster. It's kind of like a, it could be like a computer. We can talk about it. And, and this is why we got into the, me the mechanistic worldview, because we could talk about it like a machine in some way. <clears throat> when you have a system that's new um, in your computer or whatever, it takes a while for it to process. And then once it's done processing, it comes up and it gets more efficient and faster the more that you're able to process. So you understanding your own process. That's that's the power right there. Know your process. Understand your process. When when an emotion comes in, when you're pissed off, when you're angry, when you're sad and depressed and all these emotions that don't they feel icky, how do you process? What do you are you allowing yourself to go through the entire process? I'll tell you that um sadness is a good one for me that I've always been able to process. Um anger is one that I had to work on a little bit. Um but anxiety, it has been one that has been challenging for me. It, it's a new um, experience for me. I didn't have so much, or I held the anxiety and so much I didn't feel it. I don't know. But anxiety was something that started to trigger um, as soon as the pandemic hit, really. And I think that that's what happened with a lot of people. It was a very stressful time. There was a lot going on. And to process anxiety for me has taken a lot of practice. 
how do I process the anxiety and allow it to go all the way through so I'm not suppressing it or taking medications or whatever. Now, I'm not saying if you're taking medications, stop. I'm not a doctor. Um, but I refuse to take medications because I believe we have the power to overcome and transform. And if I take medications and don't allow myself through the entire process, I'm hindering the process of processing. <laughs> I'm hindering the process of processing. What I've learned in anxiety um, is that I can process it. And it took me about a year to really figure out what it would take to help me go through the entire process um, and not take so much time to process it. So again, we have the ability to do that. So our body is sort of like a, a machine, but not really. But our thoughts and all that are not. Where the hell do thoughts come from? Right? They just like come in and our mind just go blah, 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 blah. And it's just going. It's not like a machine. Weird shit comes into our head. We dream. We're like, what is this? Right? Our brain is like the connection to the quantum world if we let it be. And our body is sort of the vessel that allows us to move through that quantum space. I mean, it's pretty kind of cool when you think about it, right? That's why I said the human body, I mean, our existence is kind of cool. If we all just appreciated it, we'd be in a different spot, I think. Okay, so let's go over this, the element of heaven. Uh, the alchemists believe that just as there are elements that make up physical reality in the below, so must there be similar elements in the above through which the Godhead operates. Uh, they saw these heavenly elements as universal principles of trinity of the force acting on everything. Using the same intuitive process that proved them um, there existed four archetypal elements in the below, so did they know that there were three basic forces in the above. Um, it is the idea that goes back to the roots of alchemy. As we can see from this section, um, the Childen oracles written in the uh, monotheistic uh, Persian mystic Zoroaster, sorry, around 600 BCE, for the mind of the father said that all things should be cut into three. Those who will, oops, sorry. Those who will ascend it, ascended, um, and then all things uh, were so divided. Uh, for the mind of the Eternal Father spoke into three parts governing all things by mind. And there appeared within the one thing, the triad. And all things flowed forth from the, the mind of the Father. So in the form of a triad. So it's kind of funny because, well, this is pretty interesting. I just had a whole epiphany. Here's the deal. <laughs> it's kind of funny. From my, it, this is a theory for me, okay? Why we see things in a three dimensional time space um, and why we're here in the body. The father, because I don't believe God to be a father, <laughs> first of all. Uh, that's my belief, right? Or a mother. I believe it's both, right? It's, 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 we it and it's too vast to even understand, right? I don't even think we could label it or put words on it. But I would say in alchemy, what they're talking about from my what I think in terms of my alchemy is that when they talk about the Godhead, the Father, they're talking about our ability to have consciousness and see the world through our lens. Okay, and this is depicted in I have some sacred geometry that shows how it should operate because when you look at what happens in the above the above is not a triad and and i don't agree with this in the book this is where i think they've made a mistake in alchemy personally okay um and this is where i think i am going to write my books because there's something definitely missing within the the alchemic formula that they came up with now when was it taken out? Because the sacred feminine is not honored. And this is where the biggest, I feel, trick happened in alchemy. And I don't know that anybody can see it. Or they weren't taught it. Or they don't know enough about alchemy. Or they're not applying the work to their own life. And so they have no idea how it operates. They're just regurgitating information without going through it. 
Now, as an alchemist, that's an, in my opinion, that's a no-no. Why? Because we as alchemists go through the process. That is a true alchemist. We apply, okay? We apply this to ourselves. Yeah, but it's beyond that. So radio projects, what I'm not, I'm not talking about the microcosm. I'm talking about the macrocosm, two different things. So we ourselves in alchemy are stuck on the microcosm. That's, that's the biggest issue. They've taken out the macrocosm. So it's really hard for me to describe without showing my charts and models and everything that I've created. Um, what you're talking about is the is the microcosm. And we know how to operate that because there's tons of books, how to operate the chakras, how to do the awaken the kundalini, how to, but then there's the above. And the above is the connection to the collective unconscious, if you will, or the unconscious. In the unconscious is the veil, the veil of where the sacred feminine exists. It's that dark space. Like if you meditate and you're going into the ether, we call that the womb, the sacred womb where everything and nothing exists. Okay. Um, so the Godhead was created from the projections of our vision to be able to see. When you look at our vision, right, it's flipped and then it crosses. Our vision crosses and that creates a pyramid, which is a triad. And at the top of it is the Godhead. So they're not honoring the sacred feminine that comes from the above, which is a, a, a downward facing pyramid, not an upward facing pyramid. We could see it through the vision. And I hope I explained that well enough because it's really kind of hard to put words to it. Um, but let's just say I've been to that place in experience. Um, where I was able to see the entire program happening. And it was pretty interesting to see it operate the way it did. Of course, I had to come back and be rebirthed, which was a scary thing. I don't even know how to describe it. It was just kind of a, a scary thing. But, it, you know, birth is not a fun thing anywhere. So, yes, um, the sacred feminine being the above and the below, but I'm talking about the above. So the Godhead, I can see this This is not correct in my mind. Sorry. Um, and, and I do. I find loopholes in books all the time where I'm like, nope, I don't believe that. And again, it's theoretical. I'm not saying I have the ultimate truth. But from my understanding and my connection to alchemy, it's incorrect. That's what I'm going to say. I feel it's incorrect. It doesn't work for me. So we, uh, me changing the paradigm. Okay, so for the mind of the father, it said that all things should be cut into, th into three. Those will ascend in and then all things were so divided. For the mind of the eternal father spoke into three parts, governing all things by mind. See, governing. The mother doesn't govern. <laughs> all right, I, I'm going to have to mark this part of the book. All right, and there appeared within the one thing, the triad, and all things flowed forth from the mind of the Father in uh, the form of the triad being preexistent. Man, this is the perfect, sorry, you guys, I'm having so many epiphanies right now, it's crazy. Not the first essence, but the quality thereby all things are measured. See, measurement, here we go. This is um, from the fountain of fountains from within the matrix containing all. Okay, here's the deal. Ah, this is perfect for my model. Oh my God, this is so awesome. Okay, first of all, governing. The governing mind is the sacred masculine, okay? And the father from the triad in the pre-existing, not the first essence, but the quality whereby all things were measured. Measurement, again, is masculine energy. This is the problem. This is it right here. This is the issue. And and because of this, we don't know how to get out of the matrix. We don't understand how to, because they've only given us part of the story. That's only part of it. That's not the full story. And that's not even the full model. That's only half of the model, which tells us how perhaps the world was created through the sacred feminine and through what we call the triad, which then again becomes a pyramid. 
Oh my God. Okay. So I have a lot to do today. You guys, I just had like this mind blowing experience reading that because the Godhead and how it works becomes a triad, but the upward, the opposite facing pyramid is the sacred feminist and that feminine. So we have to consummate the two, but why his, his story, right? They say his story has been his story is because this world was created specifically for the sacred masculine. So when people talk about, and here's this will hopefully maybe blow your mind. I don't know. Maybe you guys have heard it. I don't know who else is speaking about it because I don't listen to anybody. I just read my books and do my studies. The way that we are going to step into a different dimensional time space is by recognizing that we exist in a masculine projection right now. We live in the masculine projection, and the only way to get out of it is to recognize that projection and understand how to move through that projection back up to the sacred feminine. We need to move upward, and we'll start to see different things appear. Our life will change completely. So we have to bridge the gap between the two. And hopefully this book addresses that. Because if it doesn't address it, then I'm going to say that this book needs to be rewritten. <laughs> I'm sure that um, uh, Dennis William Hawk would be like, whatever. And I'm going to be like, whatever. <laughs> because that's where they screwed things up, okay? There's not just the father, okay? There's, there's not. There's the father and the mother. And when we consummate the two, we have holism. <sighs> to these uh, three original celestial elements, the alchemists assign names to the chemical substance that exhibited similar characteristics. They call the father the, our masculine principle, sulfur. To the son, our androgynous principle, they gave the name Mercury and the mother or feminine principle within matter called salt. Just as the elements of the blow partake in characteristics of the earth in their manifestation, so do the elements of the above share the spiritualizing element of air. Thus, airy, uh, ether, uh, ethereal fire corresponds to sulfur, airy water corresponds to mercury, and airy earth corresponds to salt. Most of us um, are already familiar with these three archetypal forces from the above, since they recur throughout the world's regions. In Christianity, they are the Holy Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, I'm sorry. I literally um, don't agree with all this. So I'm just letting you know. I'm going to read it. You guys can have whatever you believe about it. Hey, Lorac, you can believe it if you want to believe it, but I don't. This theory is incorrect. It's not right. <laughs> Why not? Um, it, well, because if I showed you the models and charts, then you'd understand that the above has nothing to do with the father and just the father. The reason that there's a projection of the world in a three-dimensional time space is because we're seeing it through the patriarch. We're seeing it through the, the, the masculine. And in order to get to fifth dimensional, sixth dimensional time spaces, we need to see it through the sacred feminine. Okay. The president and prime ministers. Russia and Korea have both been riding horses. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't really, I should pay attention to what's going on in the world and I'm not. I'm so busy over here trying to figure out what their next move is. It's obvious. They don't want the secret feminine to go away and it doesn't need to. Maybe I missed something. You said something about horsemen. Oh, did I? No, I don't think so. Did I read something about horsemen? No, I don't think I did. Maybe I said something. Maybe that's what you heard. Maybe because that's what you wanted to hear. Oh, don't you have to apologize? Don't worry about it. 
Maybe there's something in there for you. Go read about the horseman. Maybe there's something's calling to you about the horseman. <laughs> Some story, myth story, or I don't know, something. Um, okay, so interesting, though. I don't agree with this book. I think when I first read it, um, God, it's been many, many years ago that I read it. Um, I was, see, that's the thing. I've evolved past a lot of these things because I've read so much and I've, I've applied alchemy to my life for so long that I can see misdirects in certain things. And those misdirects are the reason why we are stuck and we don't know how to get the hell out. So we're doing psychedelics. We're doing all kinds of shit, weird shit. We don't need to. We just need to understand this and apply it to our life. Um, I don't know, like, what I have to offer. I was talking to a friend, right, the other day. And I'm going to say this before I let you guys go. But I was talking to a friend the other day about all this stuff. And people go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they don't know what I'm talking about. And it's okay. And my friend said, well, maybe your information is for the next generation. Maybe they will understand and I imagine you guys understand what the hell I'm talking about. I hope. <laughs> but I do have people who come later and go, oh, now I get what you were saying. Now I understand, right? Now I get it. So in order for us, I'm going to say it again, for us to transcend it, we need to get over this triad thing, masculine patriarchy. It's not that we don't love the patriarch. It's not that it's not part of this storyline. It's that we're stuck in the patriarch. We're stuck. It's like almost like we're in jail. And we need to transcend that storyline. We need to understand that we, we need to arise out of it. Because once we do, we're able to reach other dimensional time space. The above is not the father. That's like, no. They, they, that's wrong. It's incorrect. I'm not going to give you incorrect information that I believe is incorrect. Okay. Hey, Poetic. I'm just because I feel like I would be misdirecting you. Now, I would say if you don't believe it, go read for yourself. Go figure it out for yourself. You don't have to believe everything I say either. Again, my theory. But I have charts and models to describe and depict what I'm talking about. Hey, I forgot about what you said about the magician yesterday. Um... Yeah, so the magician, if you look at the magician and you look at the tarot card, you'll see that his hand is in the above and the below. And he is the vessel that's in between the above and below. And if you look at the a magician's table, you'll see that he has all the elements he needs to co-create in the material world. So he has the swords, the pinnacles, the wands, and the cups. And they all lay on his table ready to be co-created. So his hand from the above is reaching into the sacred, and that would be the sacred feminine, not the sacred masculine. And he takes that and he creates with the sacred masculine. So this is a trip, you guys. I didn't even realize that this, that this goes back way, 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 way ancient. So I would say that the curse of white supremacy started probably in ancient times when they split, okay, um, the two. When they said the above and the below, and then they made the above masculine. And that's not, that's incorrect. That's totally wrong. No, <laughs> it's not. <sighs> you could even think about it as, a, as like a female, right? Like a female, if we look at it, the woman is the above, right? Because the child in the womb, which is above, and then it comes out into the material world, which is the below. I mean, it's it's even in nature. This is where they screwed us up, man. What about Persian supremacy? New beginnings, traditionally the magician. Card of the day. Yay. Yes, and it is new beginnings. Um, it also means that you have all the tools that you need to co-create. Like you have everything on the table. It's all there for you. So which tools are you going to use to move forward? Um, thought it was funny. Yeah, it's awesome. Persian supremacy. Um, uh, what about Persian? Oh, the rock. Um, yeah, it could be the same thing. It could be the same thing. Um, I don't know what um, Persia supremacy looks like, but if it's under the masculine archetypal energy, it could be, you know, bigger than that. 
It lasted for thousands of years. Yeah. Because supremacy is, um, and it can, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have different types of supremacy right now. We're just under the curse of white supremacy. That doesn't mean that we can't be under the curse of black supremacy, female supremacy, right? Feminist, feminine, it, exactly. So you guys are getting it, right? So how? Okay, so we glorify. Well, this goes into a bigger conversation, and I'm going to write a book about it. <laughs> that is my goal. My goal is to write a book about it, Breaking the Curse of White Supremacy, and it's going to be an alchemic process to Breaking the Curse of White Supremacy, which will talk about the how. It'll talk about how we've created it and how it's been created. We could, we could have created black supremacy as well. It could have gone the other way. And yes, you're right. Supremacy being glorifying um, something and, and creating it. But I'll say that this curse of white supremacy runs deeper and vaster than any feminist supremacy that you're talking about and all that. It, it, it's beyond that. It's, it's, it's greater than. And I'll tell you why. It's because there was a split of the above and the below. The duality that we uh, created allowed us to glorify one and to to bastardize another when they're in fact need to be together they need to be consummated and put together as one thing only for glorify jesus and is somewhat Jew, jewish or arabic um and that's fine you have your beliefs you uh wh however they work for you is fine right the, for me um when I'm talking about this curse, it has it has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with all of that. It has to do with the fact that the, al the alchemy, right, through spiritual alchemy, they have created this duality. And then the duality caused this. And why for consciousness to open up? It's not a bad thing, right? It's not right, wrong, good, or bad. Everybody will freak out. You say white supremacy and everybody freaks. It's like, no. I don't understand it from the concepts that other people understand it. They automatically think skin color, which it has. It played out that way. The alchemy has played out that way. How do I want to describe? Let me see if I can describe. So when we as out spiritual alchemists set something into motion, when we put something into motion, there is a consequence for it. But we have to take it back to the intention and the beginning of the alchemy. The intention and beginning of the alchemy was not skin color. Okay. But people automatically go there because we've been programmed that way. We, nobody understands how to use spiritual alchemy. Nobody, not many people are reading about it or diving into it or truly understanding, you know, the root of how they utilize the above and the below. People don't really look into it. So automatically when you say a concept their mind can only pull from the information that they understand and know this this is beyond right this is beyond the skin color this is not about skin color it's about the elixir it's like taking the potion it's like i created this potion now you drink it there's a consequence to it those consequences are a result of the alchemy but they're not the alchemy themselves if that makes sense. Okay, I'm trying to make sense of this. It's really hard, but I am going to write a book. And so it'll give you some understanding of how and why. Um, and really, if I could put it into a simple thing, it's because they created separation. That's it. I mean, we know that, right? But how did they create separation? And how has it been constructed into the very fabric of our existence today? Literally, it's in the fabric of everything not just color pigmentation well yeah color pigmentation but it's like in chemistry like it's in everything crazy it's just mind-boggling i'm like holy shit this is crazy um and it's not just white supremacy it's also masculine white supremacy because we live in the patriarch not all systems live in the patriarch not all people live in the patriarch okay there are still some tribes that i believe are living through the matriarch 
Now, there's consequences for that, too. So we ha it's not right, wrong, good, or bad. What we need to do as a society to heal is to honor both. We need to honor both. Alchemy honors all of it. It doesn't throw anything out. It doesn't say one's right or wrong or good or bad. It says, how do we integrate it so that we can transform? Because we're already whole, perfect, and complete. But we have <laughs> said that we're not, and so we think we need to be fixed. We just need to integrate. I've said this a million times. You just need to reintegrate. Once you reintegrate, you start to heal. Once you start to heal, again, you change your DNA, RNA, all that stuff, and you have different experiences. Then you can actually move through three-dimensional time spaces to fifth-dimensional, sixth-dimensional, whatever it is, time space. But it's missing a huge part. And guess what we've been taught? Education systems, everything. Now, when we talk about, like he was talking about the Persian uh, supremacy, probably similar. Someone utilized spiritual alchemy. Okay, we can go back in history and it'll be pegged to spiritual alchemy and they misused it in a way that benefited them. And then it grew. And then we were under that curse and we had to break that curse. And that we're in the same system right now. We just got to break that curse. <clears throat> Once we understand how to do that, excuse me, then we can start to transcend and create a whole new earth. Sounds easy, but it's not. It's a lot of work. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to write a book. So hopefully you guys will read it once I write it. I'm going to be doing this for, um, I think, my master's project, start laying out the foundation. And then as I get my PhD, I will be writing it and perhaps maybe even doing research on it. Um, and the end goal is to create a place where we can deal with spiritual problems like reintegration and allowing people who quote unquote think they're mentally crazy and they're not to get the spiritual support they need to heal. Because that's what's missing as well, is that piece of spiritual healing where people think they're crazy because they hear voices and they're not. They're just having an ex spiritual experience. That's the paradigm that I hold. That's the way that I see life is that it's in a spiritual experience and, and it's been taken away from them. It was honored back in ancient times, right? And they take, they've taken that away. They have said, nope, you're crazy. We're putting you in a loony house and we're going to drug you up. And instead of helping those individuals through the spiritual realm and let them know, okay, I heard a voice once scared the F out of me, but I never have been since uh, 2017. Yeah. So there you go. You weren't crazy. Then again, my ex was a witch. Oh, so there you go. So you, you have had those experiences and it's, it's just a, a spiritual experience. We have the ability to move through those experiences in a spiritual way. They call it spiritual problems. And now I can tell you right now, more and more people are honoring that. Okay. More and more people are saying, hey, let us help you through this spiritual emergency. It's, it's really a spiritual problem that you're facing. It, it's not you're crazy. When we go through it, we can then see the medicine that's meant for you. I left her. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad, especially if she was a manipulation witch. <laughs> manipulation witch. Okay. So anyway, there you have it. Um, we're going to continue on. Um, I want to rewrite this book now. <laughs> Just kidding. But I will tell you from my perspective what I think. That's why I do this. And I read and then I'm like, mm, I don't agree. Um, and I'll tell you why. And then you can do your own research and figure out if you agree with me or not. You don't have to. Um, and what works best for you right? Because your alchemy is going to be different than mine. So there you go. All right. So I love you guys. Have a best day ever. And then I will see you guys on Monday. Okay. Bye-bye.